I want to talk about a big idea on how to correctly draw the perimeter for government software systems. Many times in society, we are in the position of thinking, of analyzing, of criticizing, of designing a government software system. Then I want to think about how we choose what lies inside the government software system and what lies outside. How do we do best with the power of the government, with the coercive power of the government, with the expenditure power of the government? And how do we do best by harnessing capabilities of the society that lie outside? My starting point is uh, a famous quotation by the great economist John Maynard Keynes. Uh, Keynes said that the job of government is not to do things that the private sector would do, and it is not to do things that the private sector would do a little bit better, but to do the things that the private sector would not have done at all. Okay, so that's the way we should think about it. Government should fill a gap that would otherwise not be filled. That's the essence of what we do in government. And everything else, it's better to let it get done by a competitive private industry. And I will go through three examples where we will apply this kind of design reasoning. Okay, so let's start at uh, the railway reservation system. Okay, so one of these days we are going to have a big ideas recording by Renuka Sane, and she's going to talk about the wisdom of having private companies run railway trains. But for right now, let's just stick to the present environment that it's entirely government. Indian Railways owns the rails, Indian Railways runs the trains. There is only one railway reservation system and that is run by Indian Railways. Now, how would you draw the boundary? How would you define the perimeter of the Indian Railway reservation system? There are two ways to approach it. In one way, you would think that the government will run a comprehensive railway reservation system. In that case, the government is on the hook for solving all problems. Okay, will it be a mobile phone app? Will it work on a tablet? Will it work in a web browser? Will it uh, work through uh, third party private uh, travel uh, reservation systems? Will it work for the blind? Will it work in the vernacular? Okay, there are hundreds of questions and decisions that have to be made. And the government will design one system. It will be one system. It will be a monopoly. There will be no competition. There will be no pressure to change. Okay. Can we do this better? And the answer is yes. We can do it much better by having one simple principle. The principle is the government should do what government only can do. There is a unique thing that only Indian Railways can do, which is to exhibit an API through which railway reservation can happen. So imagine that there are empaneled private vendors who would get a registration with the government and then they would get the API access into the government system and there would be multiple competing systems. You would land up on clear trip and you would get train tickets. You would have multiple mobile apps which try to give you uh, reservation mechanisms for trains in India. Some apps would be free, they would be funded by ads. Some apps would charge you money on a per ticket basis. There would be a spectrum of choice. There would be full service travel agents who would integrate these capabilities into their own systems. And then they would give you all kinds of human services on top of the core uh, railway reservation system. There would be competition in the user interface. Many different people would imagine different, different kinds of user interfaces. There would be a railway reservation mechanism where you would end up talking to the app. Okay, All these innovations will happen because there is a competitive private sector environment. The key is to get the energy of the private sector in. The private sector is great at engaging with consumers, at segmenting consumers, at figuring out thousands of kinds of users and serving them each in various ways. This is actually what government is very bad at. Government is arrogant. Government is a monopoly. 
the government will just build some college project type system. It will be up and running. And after that, the government will say, hey, we are running. We've got a railway reservation system up and running. There'll be some minister who will come and inaugurate. There is no pressure to change. There is no criticism. And there is no possibility of progress. Okay. Whereas in the API approach, we focus the government on doing what the government does. And everything else is done by private people. And the correct line to draw is API access. In this case, what you want is an empaneled private vendor because there is a credit risk problem. If a random order comes in, then you want to be sure that the payment will also go with the order. Alternatively, we can remove all empanelment concepts. And we say that first you come with the money, you pre-fund every transaction. And then after that, the uh, remote user can just make a transaction of buying a ticket without any need to know who is this private company who is plugging into the railway reservation system. This is even better because then you don't get into the problems of favoritism and empanelment and some people are friends of the government, some people are cut off. All those things go away because you've got a fire and forget stateless system that a transaction comes in, it is pre-funded, then a railway ticket is bought and the transaction is completed. Okay, So this is my ideal solution for how we should think about the railway reservation system. And there are natural analogies going on here with airline reservations. All over the world, there are many, many airlines and there are protocols and standards by which you build one more uh, travel agent company, you plug into those protocols and everything gets up and running. Okay, very well. This is a good idea. Let's go one step further. Let's apply it to the census of India. Okay, now the census is a public good. It's a statistical system where the government spends taxpayer money to obtain data about the country and then gives that data back to the country for free. Okay, that is the meaning of a census where we are producing a public good that is funded by the taxpayer. Okay, once again, we need to be razor sharp here. The role of the census is to produce the public good of certain census data. The role of the census is not to make money. The census is not an organization that is trying to make profit or earn a revenue stream by giving out certain data sets. The whole concept of a government-run census is that we are going to use the spending power of the government. Okay, the government raises money from taxpayers using the coercive power of government by using violence against individuals in the society. That precious money is used to create data. That statistics of the census is the public good that the government gives the society. Okay, so how would we organize ourselves and what would be the perimeter of the census system? And the answer, once again, is very clear. A level one system can be, you just make a dumb website and put everything out. So put the data sets that are produced by the census, put them out to the world for download, and the government doesn't need to know anything about the people outside who are consuming the census data. Okay, they, There is no need for a name, for a password, just make data available for download. So the standard data releases of all the good censuses of the world where you have a list of villages and then you have a list of columns which are characteristics of the village, a list of the cities, a list of the districts, and a bunch of columns that are characteristics of the cities. And in a good census, you would take uh, one in 10,000 of the individual level records. You would anonymize the records and release that as a public domain data set. You would release the uh, data set of all the uh, dwellings, dwelling places of India, which can be used for random sampling when private people want to conduct surveys. All those things, just release them. And the job of the government is to just release the data and be out of it. It is not to generate revenue streams. It is not to think about X is a desirable use and X is not a desirable use. Or Z is a desirable person or not a desirable person. That is not the job of government. The census has used public money and it is incumbent upon it to produce a public good 
and to release it. And all this requires is a website where all the data is released. There should be no login name and password to get entry into that system in order to download all the census data. And of course, there should be no charges. Now you can do this a little bit better. You could design an API. So imagine the government would have API access to the census data. And once again, this should be given out as a public good so that the private sector will innovate on top of this. The private sector will build value added applications where they treat the census data as a resource, where API queries go there, get the data, come back and go do useful things in the world. That would be nice. Okay. So a good example of this kind of hybrid database that is in a website and then API based access is the United States FRED system where all the data is available on a website, you can look at it, but more importantly, it is available in an API. So you can build third party value added applications and run on top of it. And nowhere in this is there a need for a name, password, anything. Just everybody in the world is welcome to come and use it. Taxpayer money has been used to build this. Just give it back to the society as a public good. Okay, so this is my second example, which is census. The correct boundary of the census system is not a user interface, is not to make it friendly, is just to release the data and give out the data and make it available without any friction to the society. And then private people will figure out what to do with it. And now third and last, I want to talk about GDP data. Okay, so all over the world, there is a government statistical system which makes and releases GDP data. So then first, same idea, just give API access, release the GDP data with API access so that anybody in the country, anybody in the world can plug into an API, can access every little detail of everything that is known by way of the national account statistics. And then private people will go value add on top of that. There will be many, many applications. So that's one natural idea that don't get into the complications of making physical reports or PDF files or you know the website which represents the national account statistics. The job of the government is simple. Make the data, release it, give API access. And after that, the government is out of it. So that's where you draw the boundary that the private sector will pick up the data that is being released by the CSO and will add value by doing 1000 things. So there is no value add when the CSO tries to make a chart out of the GDP data. In fact, private people make better charts than what the CSO is capable of. So once again, the coercive power of the government is used to create taxpayer money. The resources are used to hire individuals at the CSO and they are creating a public good and the job of the government is to release that public good and stop there. Just give the data to the people, give the data to the society, and the society will figure out thousands of good things to do with this data. But now here, I want to draw on the big ideas which Shivam Mishra did here a short time ago. This is about the software that goes into making the national account statistics. Okay, so the GDP calculation is actually just a list of manipulations applied upon certain underlying data. So there is some agriculture data, there is some non-food credit data, there is some index of industrial production data. There is a variety of underlying data sources and there is some addition subtraction using which the GDP data is made. So I would actually go one step further that a good government strategy would be to not just release the GDP data, which is the output of a certain calculation, but to release the software using which the GDP data is calculated. So there is no secret, there is nothing deep inside GDP data. It is certain public domain data. There is the index of industrial production, there is some non-food credit, there is some uh, agriculture data, etc. All that data is anyway government statistical system data. So stage one, imagine all that data comes out into the public domain as a list of files from the CSO. Then stage two, imagine that the CSO releases the software and the software embeds all the calculations and all the assumptions 
using which GDP is computed. And then the GDP data comes out with API access. Imagine that this full release is done by the CSO. Okay? Why would this be better? This would be better at two levels. First, because everybody would be able to see all the numerical constants and all the assumptions that are being made when computing the GDP data. The best documentation of all is the code. So you should release the code. And then everybody can see what are the numerical constants and the assumptions and the steps that are used to make the GDP data. Occasionally, there are mistakes in the code. Occasionally, there are wrong assumptions that are going in. When the code is released, thousands of eyes out in the world will rapidly see the errors, and the criticism will arise, and immediately the errors will get solved. Whereas if the code is not released, if the assumptions are not laid bare in terms of the computer software, then there is a greater likelihood of those mistakes being there. And finally, all computer software is buggy. So releasing software is a way of making sure the software gets debugged. Okay? And third, suppose people have a different view on many of the assumptions compared with what the CSO thinks. Once the code is released, it will become possible for multiple diverse thinkers and analysts in the world to implement their own assumptions, to modify the constants and change the assumptions and recompute the GDP data. And so then the knowledge and the wisdom in the world will go up. Rather than treating the GDP number as one hard number which has come out of some government organization. And then there is always the unhappiness and the skepticism where people say, but no, we don't believe the GDP data. Very well, here, here's the underlying data, the IIP data and the non-food credit data. Here is the code, you look at it. And if you feel like you make changes to the assumptions, and then you will get your own sense of trust and judgment about what works and what doesn't work, and you form your own point of view. So remember, means and ends. The purpose of the government statistical system is to improve knowledge and analytical insight and intellectual power in the society. It's not just to release the GDP number. So by doing this full release strategy, we will actually improve knowledge and trust and understanding in the society.